So welcome to um, uh, uh, PIMSA evening lecture. Now today we got a uh, very important uh, topic in pediatrics. In pediatrics being discussed uh, today in the evening lecture today, and uh, that is dengue infection in children. So uh, now there was a time uh, dengue had uh, very high mortality, and uh, nowadays we know we have come a long way from that. And uh, there is uh, you know very uh, low <laughs> mortal rate now. So uh, I think um, for that uh, we have to be thankful to pioneers in doing that. And today we have one of them in Professor uh, R. Mudiyanse who have been a, in fact a pioneer in this, so which helped uh, the country to bring down the mortality to this low rate uh, nowadays we are experiencing. So. Professor Mudiyansi doesn't need the introduction. Of course, we all know that he is a professor in pediatrics at the Faculty of Medicine in Peradeniya, and he's a proud alumni of uh, Peradeniya from 77-78 batch. And, uh, and we all know he's a very good uh, communicator as well. So uh, without much ado, so let me introduce and uh, invite Professor Mudiyansi to talk to you on dengue infection in children. Over to you, Mudi. Thank you, Dushara. Thank you. It's uh, uh, hopefully this will not be a stressful lecture. It's just a relaxed talk. I will be sort of having a chat with students. I can see 130 students. Uh, we'll try to interact as much as possible. So I will straight away got get on with my lecture. Uh, so it's uh, is. It may not be just about dengue, it's something we'll see, we'll go ahead with uh, some scenarios. So yes, it's dengue infection that we are going to talk. Okay, right. I like you all to use chat box and then uh, what do you think about this case? You are the house officer, you are going to be very soon. 7 p.m. on a day you are on call. A father carry a child, five years old with the history of fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, cold extremities. You go and feel pulse, no pulse. Blood pressure is not recordable. What are your thoughts? Add your comments in your chat box. What are your thoughts? What is the diagnosis? Come on. I don't the chat box. Well, they can talk as well, right, Willie? Yeah, you can. They can talk. Yes, yeah. Why not? Please. Dengue shock syndrome. That's a good idea. What else? What are the possibilities? Append acute appendicitis. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. All right. Okay. But what is the cardinal thing here? What is the most relevant info information piece of information here? Abdominal pain, vomiting. What is the most important thing? Pulseless shock, isn't it? No pulse and child is in shock, isn't it? So that's the most important thing, the no pulse, no palpable pulse, blood pressure is not recordable. So it is shock, it's not just compensated shock, it's uncompensated extreme shock. So child has shock. What are the possible differential diagnoses? Yeah, somebody has written hypolemic shock, septic shock. They are all right, but then the, the value, but the most important is the fact that this, this you have a case of Pulseless shock, isn't it? Pulseless shock is a is an extreme of uh, uncompensated shock. What will you look for with this scenario? Yeah, okay. Somebody has said hypovolemic shock, septic shock, dengue shock syndrome. If it is dengue shock syndrome, how do you grade it? Grade one, two, three, four. Pulseless shock. DHF3 or 4? No, it's not grade 3, it's grade 4, isn't it? When you have parcel shock, it's, uh, it's, it's grade 4, DHF grade 4. 
Okay, so what are the information that you look for? Now we have to examine this patient, isn't it? What are the information you like to gather? I will look for these things. Capillary refilling time, six seconds. Level of coldness extend up to knee and elbow. Is it important to look for level of coldness? Yes, the cold extremities is not good enough. You need to look care for the level so that when you resuscitate, you can see it's coming down. Urine output, none for last six hours. Level of consciousness is drowsy, but talk few words. Now, somebody without pulse talking, something special, isn't it? That's something you'll see in dengue. And uh, you have tender liver, patient has ascites, patient has pleural effusion. So what is the diagnosis again? If you look at this pulse, uh, the, the blood counts, you can see a child has low white cell count, low platelet, and high hematocrit. So it's more, more life like DHF, isn't it? DHF grade four. So most likely diagnosis, DHF grade four, septic shock is possible, meningitis is possible, poisoning, the somebody said acute appendicitis with sepsis, yes. So they are all possible, but then very likely diagnosis, DHF grade four. Right, so next question is, how are you going to manage this patient? You are the house officer, 7 p.m., what are you going to do? Just write down in the chat box or you can talk. Tell me what are you going to do? So you have pulseless shock, probably DHF grade four. The septic shock cannot be excluded at this moment because child has had fever and other meningitis or encephalitis cannot be excluded. Fluid resuscitation is not a good enough answer. You are sort of, you know, solid answer to this question. Say if I ask this question in the exam, fluid resuscitation will carry only 10% of the marks. Can you let the patient first assess his ABC and resuscitate? Again, it's not a... Now, what are you worried about ABC? He's talking, isn't it? He talked few words. Check CRP and ESR level. Ah. Who is that? CRP and ESR level? That's a matty talk. Sorry about it. I was in the kind of thing. Relaxing. Uh, 30 ml per kg fluid bolus is wrong. Get history and day of fever wrong. 0.9% normal saline free flow. Okay, stabilize the child cannula. Fluid resuscitation followed by blood transfusion. Not, not really good, you see. You see, I mean, the, I know that when you write type from the chat box, it's not possible for you to give a comprehensive answer, but then you should make an attempt to make a comprehensive answer. You see, the, it's very important to make it comprehensive. Okay, now look at my answer. Attend with care, immediate attention. You get up from the chair, you go and sort of attend to the patient. Immediate attention is essential. And then you talk to the father, tell him that you are going to look after this child and you know, child is critically ill. And keep the child on the bed, keep him flat is very important. This child pulseless in shock. Keeping flat is important, and then raise the lower limb. That itself will improve a lot of, uh, will pump a lot of fluid into the into brain. And then call for help. Now calling for help is a vital thing in ma critic management of critical critical thing. You have to call either SHO, SHO and the nurse and ask for IV line and fluid boluses. Now here in this situation, I think best thing is to get the nurse to do the cannula because uh, you are not the best person to do it. You don't have that much of experience, or if you think you can do it. And then start oxygen. While cannulation is going on, you start oxygen and fix the patient to a monitor. And then you give this fluid bolus, 20 ml per kg, normal saline bolus, rapid while feeling pulse. And the moment you start feeling pulse, you, you give the balance 
over one hour. So that is what you should do. No pulse, start pumping fluid 20 ml per kg, normal saline bolus, you give it rapid while feeling pulse. Once, the, once you start feeling pulse, you the rest uh, over one hour. Okay, I can see some may have written 20 ml per kg fluid resuscitation, but it's more detailed than that, isn't it? And then you take blood sample, uh, blood sample for most important thing would be here, no pulse, I will do a grouping and DD. Full blood count, serum electrolyte. VBG is important because if there's acidosis, you are going to correct it. Blood sugar, low sugar, you are going to correct it. Calcium is important because if there's hypocalcemia, you are going to correct it. So they are all important investigations that you should mention. And then I have put talk to father once again. Uh, I just want to sort of, you know, see the difference of this answer. You have to sort of, you know, they are all important. It's not just a matter of giving fluid bolus. And uh, you should be able to give a comprehensive answer that is, that is very important in the management. Okay, so this is what you will do if you have a pulseless shock patient within the first two minutes or I mean first five minutes. Right, you have another case here. Read it and give a diagnosis. You are the house officer, 10 p.m. on call day. A mother carry a child, eight years, few abdominal pain. Vomiting, cold extremities, pulse palpable. Now, when you check the blood pressure, it's 100 by 78. Capillary filling time is six seconds. Level of coldness extend up to the ankle and the wrist. Urine output none and drowsy. And you have tender liver. So what is your diagnosis now? Why not you all talk? Unmute yourself and you can talk. What is the diagnosis now? Is septic shock possible? Yes, that's possible. Could this be DHF? If it is DHF, is it grade one, two, three, or four? Is he in shock? Hmm? Come on. Yes, somebody has written DHF grade three. Yes, that's very correct. Yes, this patient has shock. Is it compensated shock or uncompensated shock? This is a compensated shock, isn't it? He's, he's maintaining normal blood pressure. This is normal for this age. So he has a compensated shock. If you look at the investigations, this is what you will see. He has low platelet, high hematocrit. What does that mean? And the total white cell count is 3.5. What does that mean? Again, it's very likely it's a DHF grade 3. Why do you say leaking? Somebody has say leaking, Sachini? Why do you say it's, it's leaking? Sachini, so longer. Uh, it's bleeding, sir, because of the, it's uh, high, even if it's high. Uh, it bleeding be... or leaking? Hemoglobin is high leaking? and therefore it's leaking or bleeding? Leaky. Leaky, yes, yes. So what is the diagnosis? DHF grade 3, isn't it? Yes. So that is the that is the diagnosis. DHF grade 3. So what is your management? How do you manage this patient now? In fact, you are not 100 percent sure. Can can you have sepsis like this? Very unlikely with to have this low white cell count, low platelet, that combination, but then if you have more complicated cases, you can have such situation even. But uh, whatever it is, your management would be same. You attend with care, talk to father, keep the child on the bed and raise the lower limb and call for help. All that is there and start oxygen and give 10 ml per kg bolus over one hour. Because this is compensated shock. You are not rushing with fluid because you are dealing with leaking blood vessels. If you give too much, you know that you are going to overload. So therefore, you give it over one hour, 10 ml per kg bolus over one hour. Here, you take the blood sample and you do the same sort of investigation. You talk to the father again. You see, I have here, you reassure the father that you are going to look after. Here, you talk to the father to explain what is happening. So that's all important. Right. Go to the next case. 
So you are the house officer, 10 p.m. on call day, almost same patient. Eight years, abdominal pain, vomiting, cold extremities, pulse palpable. Here the blood pressure is 75 by 55. So what is the difference between the first patient and this case? You won't see the white cell count, yes, white cell count also same. So what is the difference here? This patient has uncompensated shock. Previous patient, normal blood pressure. This is uncompensated shock. If you want to give us the DHF grading, what is the DHF grading? It's same, DHF grade 3. Unfortunately, DHF grading does not recognize compensated shock from uncompensated shock. DHF grade 4 is no palpable pulse. DHF3 is palpable pulse. Whether it's a low blood pressure or not is not recognized. Now, this is this is not there even in the guidebook. I am just sort of you know recognizing this group. Uh, DHF grade 3 with uncompensated shock. For me, it's a different category. But unfortunately, I have not been able to sort of push that into the book. But so this is another category. And uh, it's DHF grade 3 with uncompensated shock. So what is the difference in the management? For me, if you have uncompensated shock, rest will be the same, but then give 10 ml per kg bolus fast. You give it fast. When you have uncompensated shock, I don't want to wait for one hour. I will, I want to rush, push that fluid quickly. And then the rest of the investigations are same. Okay. Right. So, when a patient present in shock, you give a, a 10 ml per kg bolus. You know that bolus, when child is getting better, you cut down the fluid gradually and then go to a maintenance level of fluid. So, at the onset, you might give very high doses like boluses like 20 to 20 ml per kg or 10 to 5 ml per kg, and then you gradually bring it down and to a, about 1.5 ml per kg as maintenance. So this is what is happening. And in the dengue scenario, uh, you have this febrile phase, critical phase, and the recovery phase. And the shock is happening within this leaking phase of 48 hours. And then if a patient has come with shock, you assume that the patient in the middle of this leaking phase, and then you manage it like this. So this is what the what we have done. We have given this fluid bolus, and after that, you cut down the fluid gradually while monitoring the patient's uh, parameters. In fact, uh, in management of dengue, one of the major problem is fluid leaking and causing fluid overload. Too much pleural effusion, too much of ascites. And uh, so therefore, uh, we try to restrict the amount of fluid that we give as much as possible. For that only you have this uh, fluid quota business. Fluid quota is calculated for M plus 5, means M is the maintenance fluid. 5% is 50 ml per kg uh, uh, the, uh, volume. And, uh, so that is the fluid quota. And in case of dengue shock syndrome, you assume you are starting from here, and then during this 24 hours, you anticipate or you expect to give only this amount, try to manage within this amount. So therefore, every hour you calculate the total amount of fluid given, and then compare with this given compared with this and see how much you are giving if you feel you are giving too much instead of giving normal saline you start giving colloids we'll discuss it later once again so so this is the scenario that happens in the in the in shock patient okay so so far we have discussed two or three cases a patient coming with no palpable pulse how to do the initial fluid resuscitation. Patient who has come with palpable pulse with 
compensated shock, how to give the fluid bolus, and the patient who has come with palpable pulse, but then uncompensated shock, how to manage. And then, but then some of these patients do not respond to uh, fluid bolus like that. And the patients not responding to usual fluid bolus is a scenario, is a situation that we have to face. And what are the causes for non, not responding to initial treatment? Write down, type on the chat box and tell me what, uh, what do you think? What are the reasons for not responding to initial fluid boluses? And does not follow the, this, uh, these features. It just sort of does not respond. What are the causes? Bleeding, yes, very good, yes. Bleeding is the one of the major cause. What else? Bleeding of one is one of the cause. Anything else? Not responding to initial fluid boluses. Acidosis, hypocalcemia, bleeding, excellent, very good. Excessive fluid leak, yes, if the fluid leak is sort of, you know, exceeding this amount and frequent vomiting leaking, yes. Okay, so this is my list. Massive plasma leakage, and that will can, the patient will not respond, there will be rising PCV. And the concealed hemorrhage, you can bleed, bleed into the tissues, into the liver into the gut and into the various places. Now, it's internal bleeding. When you say internal bleeding, it's, this is real internal bleeding. Now, when you say internal bleeding, bleeding into the peritoneum is not really internal bleeding. This is bleeding into the tissues. And you can have hypocalcemia, the cardiac functions are compromised, vascular functions are compromised, therefore you get uh, shock. And acidosis is another cause. Hypoglycemia is another cause, hyponatremia. Fluid overload can lead to shock. When you have too much fluid, it's overloaded, there's a lot of effusions, and all that lead to poor perfusion. And you can have un unusual manifestations. So these are the causes for not responding to initial treatment. So what do you do? Uh, you need to interpret this uh, situation and if you have if you have a patient who is deteriorating the blood pressure is not picking up not responding and if the hematocrit is rising what will you do in the box so number one what is your management box number one what is the management deteriorating patient hematocrit is rising come on One of the crane. You are giving fluid boluses, patient is not responding, but the hematocrit is rising. So what is the what can be the reason? Massive leaking, isn't it? What will you give? Box number one. Give colloids. Very good. Excellent. Right. Okay. So give colloids. How much you will give? You can give 10 ml per kg bolus. Colloid. And number two, patient is deteriorating, hematocrit is dropping. What will you do? Hematocrit is dropping now. What are you going to do? Blood transfusion, yes, that's very correct. Now you have uh, uh, dropping hematocrit, you give blood transfusion. But then the, if the patient is improving and the hematocrit is rising, what will you do? Number three, box number three, the hematocrit is rising, patient is improving. Come on. It depending on the stage of the resuscitation management, uh, if the patient is improving, very likely if the patient is in the recovery phase, I will not give anything. I will just maintain fluid. Why? Because by the time patient come to the recovery phase, there's a lot of fluid, extravasated fluid. 
that fluid is bound to come in and then settle this rising hematocrit. So if the patient is recovering, I will not do anything. I will just wait. And if the patient is improving and hematocrit is dropping, that's an indication of recovery. So leave him alone. Okay. So interpreting hematocrit is very important. And then we mentioned colloids a couple of times. What are the indications for colloids? There are three indications. When the hematocrit is rising after initial crystalloid boluses, you give hematocrit, uh, the, the colloids. You give crystalloids, you give crystalloids, but the still hematocrit is rising. That means there's a lot of leaking because your normal saline has very small molecules. Colloids have high, uh, bigger size molecules. So giving that can help you. And then when you see that your fluid quota is getting exhausted. Now I said you calculate the fluid quota and every hour you check how much you have given. And then if you feel that you are giving too much now, you uh, instead of normal cell and you give a fluid, uh, the colloid. And then third indication is to manage fluid overload. There you give colloid along with frusamide. The dose is 10 ml per kg power. And maximum for a day, if it is dextran, you give 30 ml per kg power. Heta starch, you can give 50 ml per kg power. So this is important because if you give too much of these, they can damage kidneys. So that is the reason. Uh, so uh, it's better to know the indications to use colloids. There are three indications. Who are the patients who are at risk of major bleeding? Add on to the chat box. Who are the patients who have major risk of bleeding? Come on. Why don't you tell us? Katakaranda. Yes, coagulopathies, uh, patients with uh, uh, coagulation disorders, coagulation disorders, bleeding. The, you see, the coagulation disorders are a rare thing, no? Everybody talk about coagulation disorder. It's not, a, it's a very, very rare thing, no? Very low platelet count is not the correct answer because that's not the usual thing. Neonate is not the correct answer. You see, it's not the platelet that costly bleeding. It's not the, it's not an issue of uh, 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 formation of that platelet plug. Issue is the blood vessels are leaking. The the major major cause of bleeding is shock. Shock, and if the shock is prolonged, your vascular endothelium is going to get damaged. Your peripheral blood vessels are getting damaged. So they, that leads to bleeding. So the shock is a, you know, the persistent shock, uh, progressive or hypotensive or prolonged shock can cause bleeding. Renal or liver failure can lead to bleeding. And the metabolic acidosis can lead to bleeding. And this is the most important one. This is the preventable one. Aspirin, uh, NISDs. Uh, uh, can make uh, DHF, fatal DHF. That is the reason why we do not allow people to use uh, ibuprofen, diclofenac sodium, or mefenamic acid, or various other NISDs in the management of fever. Now, Sri Lanka being an endemic country for dengue, uh, you should be very cautious in treating patients with ibuprofen or diclofenac sodium or mephanamic acid because of this reason. The DHF become fatal DHF if you use NISADs. Peptic ulcer and anticoagulant therapy and then any form of trauma. Now, can you see that your low platelet count is not mentioned here? So much so 
to prevent bleeding you can there's no point in giving platelets any form of trauma is an important point here and if you exert too much if there's some trauma even im injection can induce this process of bleeding there's some mechanism where uh, it induces bleeding so therefore uh, im injection should be avoided and too much exercise and trauma should be avoided okay so very low platelet is not there is not the correct answer okay so what are the indications to give blood transfusions and uh, very uh, only a small percentage of patients need blood transfusion overt bleeding that means uh, if you can see that child has bled and vomited uh, about 6 to 8 ml per kg yes give a blood transfusion and the, if the hematocrit drop suddenly rapidly less than 40 give a blood transfusion irrespective of the reason low hematocrit give a blood transfusion and low hematocrit and shock kai me and then hypotensive shock plus low normal hct now we have mentioned that earlier uh, patients who are having low hematocrit need blood transfusion worsening metabolic acidosis and refractory shock after the after two fluid boluses in fact it's the book says 40 to 60 ml per kg this is three boluses for me it's two boluses and the next one should be a blood transfusion so usually the circulatory failure with high hematocrit should be managed with colloids plus lasix if uh, fluid overload is suspected so low hematocrit you give blood transfusion high hematocrit you start initially manage with colloids yes i think somebody has put this word thank you you should have called me yes dic can cause bleeding uh, should have in, 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 included in the in the in that list agree thank you hypocalcemia is another cause of refractory shock indications to give calcium uh, if uh, grade 4 shock give calcium you see pulseless shock give calcium fluid overload patients give calcium the dose is calcium gluconate 1 ml per kg power 10% calcium gluconate and if you can do calcium level that is good to do it if you don't have facilities still give this boluses this doses yeah if you don't have facilities for calcium level give calcium above dose for critically ill thf patients and if you have severe metabolic acidosis again you need to correct it because metabolic acidosis can make shock worse acidosis is due to prolonged shock acidosis itself is due to prolonged shock acidosis may further deteriorate cardiac functions monitor blood gases regularly and give carbonate bicarbonate 1 millimol per kg power maximum is 10 millimol okay so and 1 millimol is uh, your sodium bicarbonate uh, what is the percentage 1 ml has 1 millimol no what is the strength of sodium bicarbonate 8.4% i can't remember but whatever the sort of you know thing common thing that we have you have 1 millimol per 1 ml okay if you don't have facilities for bulk gas give bicarbonate for critically ill dhf patients you see just like calcium you give bicarbonate also when to correct metabolic acidosis the initial therapeutic goal for patients with severe acidosis acidemia is to raise the systemic blood uh, uh, ph above 7.1 to a level at which dyspnea becomes less likely now one of the reason why you want to correct acidosis is it can cause arrhythmias and the cardiac contractility and the responsiveness to catecholamine will be restored indications for complications of bicarbonate therapy the bicarbonate therapy is not without complications you can have complications like volume overload hypokalemia because calcium get pushed into blood uh, cells Uh, cns acidosis bicarbonate will correct the acidosis outside the 
outside the CNS. Uh, so therefore, you can have CNS acidosis. It can lead to hypercapnia, tissue hypoxia via afterward shift of the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve, sorry, leftward shift of the hemoglobin dissociation curve. You know that hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve, there is a right shift with uh, acidosis and you give bicarbonate, it, it will have left shift where the oxygen is bound to hemoglobin and does not release. So therefore you get a tissue hypoxia. Alkali stimulation of organic acidosis and overshoot alkalosis. So they are all complications of bicarbonate therapy. Uh, some of the things can go into uh, MCQ uh, because you need to have some difficult MCQs. Also, this is a good slide to go some of the points to MCQ. Hypoglycemia is another thing that we need to correct because hypoglycemia can lead to shock or refractory shock. Uh, treat if the blood sugar is below 4 millimol per liter. Dose is 3 to 5 ml of 10% dextrose. Remember, 3 to 5 ml per kg of 10% uh, dextrose. Hyperglycemia is another complication. Uh, need to correct, control, uh, keep below 8.6 millimol per liter. Hyperglycemia, you correct with insulin infusions. That is important because don't hesitate to give insulin infusions in case of septicemia or dengue shock or whatever the condition because uh, insulin has a lot of good properties that support in, in situations in a, in a critically ill patients. And the other complication is the fluid overload. What clinical features, what are the clinical features of fluid overload? Uh, put in the chat box, what are the clinical features of fluid overload? Okay, uh, rising blood pressure, is it? I'm not very uh, convinced about that. I know that it can happen. But what are the important ones? Important ones are features like dyspnea, orthopnea, effort, effusion, societies. What else? Pulmonary edema causing shortness of breath, puff dye, puffy eyelids, distended abdomen, dyspnea, breathlessness. Yes. But then you did not mention wheezing. Respiratory distress, difficult in breathing, rapid breathing, chest tall in roving, wheezing. Now that is wheezing rather than crepitation. That is unique for DHF uh, fluid overload. And this can easily go into a MCQ. Uh, large, large plural effusions or tense societies increase jugular venous pressure. See, the rise in blood pressure is not there, but I remember somewhere somebody is mentioning that. Uh, just check that, whether it's mentioned somewhere. Ankle edema, they are not all good uh, features of uh, fluid overload. 
peripheral edema they are not uh, not real I mean, these are the sort of features of fluid overload difficult in breathing rapid breathing chest stall in drawing now rapid breathing is so important you are supposed to monitor when you are managing a patient if respiratory rate is going up by 10% you should diagnose fluid overload and give early correction of uh, uh, fluid overload by frusamide and uh, dextran so that is a important one you need to monitor and uh, one of the thing that happens is that we are little too late to give uh, correct the uh, uh, fluid overload how do you correct fluid overload management include e evaluate the stage of the disease prop up keep him flat instead of keep him flat when the fluid overload is there you have to prop up and you give dextra and 40 10 ml per kg frusamide 1 mg per kg at mid transfusion and you give oxygen consider ventilator care consider pleural or peritoneal trap now this is a sort of in, a, in only in an extreme case that you do right now if the patient is recovering you need to now remember that those who come to the recovery phase in dengue management dengue patients have accumulated fluid in the inside the body so therefore you can rapidly quickly cut down fluid give oral fluid if tolerating and dropping hematocrit is not bleeding now here during the recovery phase of of dengue fever dropping hematocrit is not bleeding rising hematocrit is stable in stable child managed with oral fluid see there are a few guide for a, uh, a fluid management in the this thing okay right so far we have discussed three important cases one case of pulseless shock second case of shock with uncompensated shock third one is with compensated shock so that's good now look at this case what is the diagnosis 80 all 6 days of fever abdominal pain vomiting and he has bleeding from the nose extremities are warm is not in shock isn't it capillary fill time is 2 seconds so there is no shock the blood pressure is normal good volume pulse but then nobody has recorded the urine output is not drowsy and has a tender liver ascites no ascites what is the diagnosis has fever and bleeding here what is the diagnosis to give a diagnosis better look at the blood counts and you have low platelet and high hematocrit here now what is the diagnosis this is likely to be dengue fever with low total count and low platelet count and what does this mean there's a high hematocrit isn't it so what is the diagnosis come on what is the diagnosis add into the chat box what is your diagnosis come on is this dengue shock syndrome hurry up what is the diagnosis is this dhf or not now this is a case of dhf grade 2 so what is the difference between the grade 1 and grade 2 grade 2 there is evidence of bd and there is evidence of leaking so this is grade 2 okay so this patient has dhf because there is evidence of leaking 
why it is grade two because there is bleeding so dhf is not because of bleeding dhf is because of high hematocrit and uh, we put them under grade two because there is evidence of bleeding so this is dhf grade two now this patient Fever six days, abdomen pain, vomiting, headache, and capillary filling time is okay. Extremes are warm, good pulse volume, good blood blood pressure. Sure, there's tender liver. And now, what is the diagnosis here? Is dengue fever or dengue hemorrhagic fever? This is dengue hemorrhagic fever because there is high hematocrit with low platelet. So there is evidence of leaking, therefore it is DHF. But there is no bleeding, therefore it's grade one. Okay, are you all with me? DHF grade one. Because it's DHF because there is evidence of leaking and it is not grade two because there is no bleeding. You see, you can see that tender liver is there in both situations. So what will you do if you have a patient DHF1 or DHF2, what are you going to do? There is no shock. And what are your management plan? Now we know that very likely patients, patient has entered this critical phase now. Patient is in the critical phase. What do you anticipate? There's high chance that he might leak more and more. And then there's a possibility that he is going into shock. That can happen within next 24 to 48 hours. So therefore, it is very important for you to predict and you need to discuss about that possibility of unpredictable excessive fluid low leaking causing shock. So therefore, you need to mention that and communicating with parents is important. And but however, you start managing this patient with a very low amount of fluid, 1.5 ml per kg, uh, because so far there is no shock. And you know that there is evidence of leaking. And at this stage, because there is no shock, you don't want to give too much fluid, because if you give too much fluid, it can make too much leaking. So you give it, as you give it, while giving, you monitor the hematocrit. As you give hemochromatic is rising, you give more fluid, more fluid, more fluid. Might end up in giving 10 to 10 to 20 ml per kg when it comes to the peak. And then by the time it comes to the peak, you draw, you understand, you realize that he is not leaking anymore because hemochromatic is not rising further. And then you know that it has spent 24 hours, and now it is coming down, and you, you gradually bring down the amount of fluid. So on the top, it may be 10 to 20 ml per kg, but then you start with 1.5 ml per kg. This is a phase of restriction of fluid up to here. And then you go on increasing if the hematocrit is rising. Otherwise, you need not go, uh, you need not increase. And then at the end, you might end up giving about 10 to 20 ml per kg in one hour. And then you bring it down and down and then sort of give only a a uh, small volume just to keep veins open. And during this period, you anticipate, you expect to manage this fluid uh, over 48 hour period, your M plus 5%, that same fluid volume we calculated earlier, uh, should be distributed over 48 hours. It's not should be distributed. The, the fluid that you used during these 48 hours should be within this M, M plus 5 percent. The fluid that you use during these 48 hours should be within this volume of M plus 5 percent. You should, you have a target, don't exceed it unless it is essential. However, many patients does not need this much of fluid we give 1.5 ml per kg, go only up to 3 to 5 ml per kg, and then recover. So must remember that. Whereas if the patient has come little late, patient is leaking, 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 
you don't come during this phase to the hospital and then somewhere here with very high hematocrit. There you don't start with 1.5 ml per kg. Here I will be starting with about 5 ml per kg and then depending on the hematocrit, either go up or go down and then manage the patient likewise. Right. Okay, so that is that scenario. You have a patient with dengue fever, low platelet. Evidence of leaking is there by rising hematocrit, tender hepatomegaly effusions. So there you manage that patient with starting with low volume of fluid and if it is necessary, you increase. Now, what is this patient? He has all the same story, fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, and uh, capillary filling time is normal, so there's no choke here. Pulse blood pressure is normal, so there's no choke, but then you have the tender liver here. And here the hematocrit is only 27, 37, and the platelet is low. So what is your diagnosis here? Write down a diagnosis. What is the diagnosis here? Is this patient leaking? Doesn't look like, isn't it? Come on, write a diagnosis. Oh, for some reason I am not, I did not see this, your comments when I'm sorry, I was, Sorry, sorry, sorry. I have not seen this uh, comment, so I don't know for some reason. Uh, somebody has asked why wheezing is prominent than crepitations. I don't know why. I don't know why, but it is they are written black and white, and personal experience is such that, uh, yes. And the murmurs is not a feature of uh, 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 fluid overload. My chat box is uh, closed. I mean, the, it's, it's hidden. I don't know why. All right. Now, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, the. Now, this is not DHF, no? If somebody says this is DHF is wrong because there is no evidence of leaking here, it's dengue fever. But then dengue fever is not a complete answer because there is a tender liver. So dengue fever with warning signs is the correct answer here. Okay, you got that point. Because not, this is not just dengue fever. A couple of people have saying that this is dengue fever. This is not just dengue fever. This is dengue fever with warning signs because there is a tender liver. How do you manage this patient? There's no problem. You just manage like any other viral fever. But then, because there is warning sign, you tend to admit these patients. You don't manage this patient at home. This, you manage this patient after admission and any other viral fever, but then monitor the PCV two or three times. When you have tender liver, the chances of leaking is high. So therefore you monitor closely. Uh, sir, in DHF grade two, is it necessary necessarily mean external bleeding only. Oh, you're asking me a difficult question. It says that DHF grade two, there is some bleeding. Don't specify whether there's internal or external. It's very likely we are talking in terms of external bleeding. Here you don't have shock because it's DHF grade two. No shock, but there's some evidence of bleeding. Probably it can be, it need not be necessarily external. You can have bleeding into the gut, into the respiratory system, so that's possible. Now this concept of warning sign is, is very important. Now, warning sign, the concept came in because people were admitting dengue fever patients indiscriminately leading to overload of patients. It's not only the Sri Lanka, all over the world, Malaysia and various other countries had this experience where doctors are admitting patients, all the dengue fever patients to the ward, 
and wards get flooded with patients and then the care deteriorates. So therefore, this uh, idea of tender, sorry, idea of warning sign came, came and where the indication for admission is fever. I mean, you have to admit DHF grade one, two, three, four, there's no problem. But then even the dengue fevers with warning signs, you admit. So these are the warning signs. This is something that you must sort of by heart this slide. Abdominal pain, no tenderness, persistent vomiting, clinical fluid accumulation, mucosal bleeding, lethargy, restlessness, liver enlargement, and increasing hematocrit, uh, concurrent with rapid decrease in platelet. So if you have these features, they are warning signs, you need to admit these patients. Okay. And then similarly, there are what is called group B patients, those who have coexisting conditions, pregnancy, infancy, old age, obesity, diabetes, renal failure, chronic hemolytic disease, peptic ulcer, they all need hospitalization. And there's a group C, adverse social circumstances, those who are living alone, living far from the health facility, no transport, again, you need to admit. So dengue fever with warning sign is another category you admit they are admitted and observed uh, for possibility of leaking by doing hematocrit two or three times. What is this case now? You have eight year old child, eight days with fever and cutaneous bleeding, mild abdominal pain, vomiting, twice headache, and NS1 antigen positive. So this has to be dengue fever. You want to see more? Yes, you have a white cell count of 5.5 uh, and platelet of 200, hematocrit is 37. So what is the diagnosis? This got to be dengue fever, no? Because antigen positive now, NS1 antigen positive. So this is dengue fever. This is called dengue fever with hemorrhagic manifestations. There are subcutaneous bleeding. So this is another entity, dengue fever with hemorrhagic manifestations. Their hematocrit is normal, platelet is normal, but they have bleeding. And this is dengue fever with hemorrhagic manifestation. What is the difference between this one and the DHF2? DHF2 will have bleeding as well as evidence of leaking. Because of the evidence of leaking, it become a case of uh, uh, DHF. Uh, but then there is no leaking here. It's not DHF. Somebody has written DHF grade 2. This is wrong. This is dengue fever with hemorrhagic manifestations. How do you manage? Almost same. Now, when there's bleeding, it's like warning sign. You will be monitoring the PCV two or three times a day. And uh, you talk to the mother. You observe and manage like any other viral fever. Uh, this patient... Again, you have this fever, abdominal pain thing, and then and NS1 antigen positive, and other things are normal. So therefore, and then you, this is your white cell count. You have normal platelet, normal hematocrit. So very likely, this is a dengue fever. And you call it confirmed dengue fever because NS1 antigen is positive. Without warning signs, you can call it dengue fever without warning signs. It's confirmed because NS1 antigen is positive. Management, you talk to the mother, manage as OPD, like any other fever, monitor PCV daily as choice. And what is the diagnosis here? Mm, the fever, abdominal pain, headache, no shock, no leaking, and there's no leaking, normal platelet, normal this thing. And it's either viral fever or dengue fever without warning signs. Here we don't have even the test. This can be either dengue fever or viral fever. Unconfirmed dengue fever. Manage like OPD, any other monitor PCV and uh, daily SOS. So when you have a patient with fever, when you are sort of having doubts whether it's a 
dengue fever or other viral fever. Uh, features may suggest dengue fee infection include when you have a lot of flushing, skin erythema, headache, retrobital pain, myalgia, arthralgia, nausea and vomiting, hemorrhagic manifestations, white cell count less than 5,000, total less than 100. They are all suggestive of uh, dengue fever. Uh, there's a question, how does hypocalcemia cause non-responding to fluid? I think because the calcium, low calcium will uh, have adverse effect on cardiac functions. Cardiac muscle contractility is compromised when you have uh, hypocalcemia. I think that is the explanation. Right, okay, we'll move to this one now. When you have uh, okay, when you have a dengue infection, only ten percent of infections are symptomatic. Only ten percent are symptomatic. What percentage of COVID patients are symptomatic? Almost similar scenario, you know, dengue and the COVID. What percentage uh, uh, symptomatic in uh, COVID? They say 20 to 25 percent. No, in dengue it's only 10 percent, and 90 percent are asymptomatic infections, and this causes zero conversion here. And then, out of these uh, symptomatic patients, a uh, very small percentage, one to two percent, develop DHF. Now, see. Others are non-specific fever or dengue fever. 98 to 99 percent are dengue fever. Only one percent is DHF. So ideally, the admission is required. Only this group should be admitted, and they are divided into four groups: uh, dengue with warning signs, B, and uh, severe dengue with compensated shock or uncompensated shock organ impairment. Uh, I'll take another 10 minutes, okay? Now, when you look at the dengue fever, uh, classification of dengue, we mentioned about classical dengue fever, where you have the fever, nausea, vomiting, arthralgia, headache, rashes, leukopenia, and uh, tourniquet is positive. And then you can have dengue fever with hemorrhagic manifestation. You have all these things plus hemorrhagic manifestation. So they are, they do not have leaking. Both categories do not have leaking. And this, these two groups are comp, uh, the, the account for about 98% of the cases. Now DHF grade one is you get the increased hematocrit, lowering of albumin, cholesterol, ascites, and plural effusions. Grade two, you have all above plus bleeding. Grade three, what do you have in grade three? Shock, isn't it? There's shock. Shock, tachycardia, tachypnea, cold extremities, reduced urine output. And grade four, no palpable pulse. And unusual manifestations, there is organ damage, brain, kidney, liver, or there may be hematological problem. So this is the sort of classification of uh, dengue. So if if a student comes and tells me after his long case that this my patient has dengue fever, I mean say has dengue, uh, I'll be worried and you know the DHF should be DHF, DF should be DF, and then you must the your case should fit into one of these diagnoses. Dengue is a leak in dengue leaking fever rather than dengue hemorrhagic fever. So the cardinal feature of dengue hemorrhagic fever is uh, leaking, not bleeding. Plasma leakage is due to transient endothelial cell dysfunction rather than destruction. So it's a transient thing. It lasts 48 hours and it recovers by itself and 
the leaking is over in 48 hours. So therefore, it's an endothelial cell dysfunction rather than destruction. Plasma leakage is evidenced by rise in hematocrit, 20% rise in children, 35 to 42, in adults, 40 to 48. So this is what we see here. And then you have fluid accumulation or effusion, and you can have circulatory failure. Albumin will be low and cholesterol will be low. So these are the five features of uh, evidence, five evidence of plasma leakage. Again, uh, can be a sort of a nice uh, one setting for a MCQ. You see, you can see a effusion. Here you don't see, but then if you turn the patient to a, a lateral decubitus position, you can see the effusion here. See, here's a massive effusion here, and you can see the hematocrit has risen here uh, to 55. So those are all features of leaking. When you have rising hematocrit, that indicate there's plasma leakage. If there's a 20 to 30% rise, GIT ischemia is very likely, including the liver ischemia. And if there's a 30 to 40 percent rise, renal and drain ischemia are likely. So you should not let the PCV rise too much. What are the causes of shock in dengue? Plasma leakage, bleeding, hypocalcemia, vascular involvement, inadequate fluid intake, and myocarditis. So you must understand that dengue is a dynamic disease. You have a febrile phase, critical phase, and recovery phase. And you have an incubation period of five to eight days. And what is the rate of fluid leak? Only thing I have to say is that it is not a static thing like this. It's more of a, a biological thing like this, like this. So it's not the it's not a box type of thing. And, and then we calculate this fluid calculation, uh, maintenance plus 5%. Uh, you calculate maintenance for 40, 24 hours, and then you anticipate not to use fluid exceeding that volume within these 48 hours. So this calculation is for 24 hours only. So you expect them to manage uh, within this fluid quota uh, over 48 hours. Right. So if you have a patient with short duration fever, there are three decisions, treat and send home, admit, but there is no need to have any resuscitation and need resuscitation. And you most of your dengue, fever, dengue hemorrhagic fever patients falling into this category. Uh, fever, treat fever, rest fluid, specific drug, educate about warning signs, and then you can send them home. And then admit, but no resuscitation. You give immediate attention, fluid, oxygen, observation. Uh, possibility is that you are dealing with uh, dengue or any other infection. Need resuscitation. Evaluate ABC care, fluid boluses, oxygen, hand over MO to MO, dengue, septicemia, diarrhea, anaphylaxis, all are possible. Fluid management basic principles are don't overload leaking vessels. You try to manage the PCV and urine pout output to prevent shock. Try to manage within fluid quota and use colloids to retain longer and give blood when indicated and use 0.5 ml per kg hour of hour is okay the, sorry urine output now the urine output you need not target at having a 1 ml per kg power uh, 0.5 ml per kg power is okay now usually the normal urine output is 1 ml per kg power but then here when you are managing dengue 0.5 ml per kg power is enough. So don't, uh, don't try to uh, give too much fluid with the intention of getting uh, uh, 1 ml per kg power urine output. You need to cut down fluid at the recovery phase. Uh, 
Okay, I'll skip that slide. If the high PCV was due to dehydration, when you give fluid something like 5 ml per kg, quickly drop down to a normal value. And you must have seen this uh, fluid chart where we plot the ml per kg per hour every hour in this chart. And then you monitor the PCV here and the urine output ml per kg per hour plotted here and then blood pressure, respiratory rate, and heart rate. So they are all uh, incorporated in this chart. And this is uh, uh, something, this is national, uh, this is the chart that is used at national level. In fact, I developed this chart uh, right at the beginning. You have your calculation for fluid quota, M, M plus 5%. You calculate for ideal body weight, your weight and height is, written here. If you give too much fluid too early, what is going to happen here? You have started giving too much fluid here. And then you cut it down like this. What will happen during this phase, this period? There will be too much leaking, isn't it? What will happen during this period? The patient is going to go into shock. So you have fluid overload and shock. So don't start giving too much fluid. I remember those days, some of the, uh, the pediatricians were telling that, of course, what I do is I give enough fluid right from the beginning. So they have, they have lost their patients because it lead to fluid overload. And, and then on the other extreme, some people, I don't give fluid early. You wait, 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 what will happen here? There's a lot of leaking here and the patient will go into shock. When the patient goes into shock, your blood vessels get damaged and you are likely to bleed and likely to leak too much. So therefore, now you start giving fluid and the, when the patient is, has stopped leaking, you are giving now too much fluid. So you have shock and then fluid overload. Again, you start by giving boluses even before patient has entered the critical phase. And here you will have fluid leaking. And then here you have shock. So fluid overload and shock. Now, you can see that we restrict fluid right at the beginning. You give only 1.5 ml per kg per hour. And why is that? What is the reason to do that? So that is the question that we ask. There are two reasons. Think of an 80 all, uh, 80 all girl. I think I'll stop in another five minutes time. Eh? Uh, 80 all 30 kilogram girl fluid for 48 hours you want to calculate. M will be 1700 for 30 kilogram. M plus 5% will be 3200. Now, if you give five ML per kg for 20, 48 hours, you are giving 7200. You are exceeding, definitely you are exceeding by 4,000 ml if you give this volume. If you give 3 ml per kg, still you are exceeding. But if you give 1.5 ml per kg, you are not exceeding. So if you give at this rate, there is some more fluid that you can give for fluid boluses. But then your calculation for 30 kilogram is not quite correct for this child. Ideal with the ideal body weight is 25 kilogram. So they are M is 1,600, M plus five is 2,850. If you give 1.5 ml per kg, you are giving only 1,800 fluid. So giving restricted amount of fluid is useful so that you can maintain your 48 hours uh, and then you have enough fluid for given for boluses. Uh, 0.5 ml per kg urine output is acceptable. Why? Now, if you give fluid to a healthy person, fluid intake of 3 ml per kg per hour, urine output will be 2 ml per kg per hour, insensible loss of 1 ml per kg per hour. They do not leak, no leaking. And dengue patient, you intake of 3 ml, urine output will be less now, only 1 ml per kg, insensible one. And then there's a leaking. Okay. Now, 
if somebody think that we need to have more urine output, you give 5 ml per kg, and the urine, the healthy person will have increased urine output. But dengue patient will not have that much of increased urine output, instead he will start leaking. So therefore, uh, restricting fluid will minimize leaking. So that is the point that we want to, I want to stress. So you have this number of unusual manifestations like encephalopathy, uh, uh, hepatic encephalopathy, and uh, myocarditis, renal failure, and a couple of things like that. I'm not going to go into those details. I think that's enough for today. I think these are all other unnecessary, not unnecessary, so something else from another, this thing. And then uh, uh, I think when you are writing the diagnosis card, better to sort of, you know, write the correct diagnosis with this dengue hemorrhagic fever grade four, grade two, grade three. And you, you can give a running commentary here, severe dengue with bleeding or no pulse. And then write the patient entered critical phase 24 hours after admission to the ward maximum hematocrit is this much, minimum was this much, platelet maximum was this, minimum was this, and the blood pressure and all that. And then management, how much fluid do we have given? Colloid boluses, uh, crystalloid boluses, blood, how much we have given? And then what complications you have noted? I think it's better to write a comprehensive diagnosis incorporating all this information. Thank you. So yeah, I took one and almost one and a half hours, no? You have any questions? You can you can ask questions if you have any questions. Yes. Do you have any questions? So probably they have asked all the questions that they wanted to ask uh, during the <laughs> lecture. I think. Is that the case? So uh, then we shall we call it a day? Right, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah fine. You. So, uh, so I'm sure the students might uh, gonna, uh, send their questions through email. Uh, yeah. to Somebody has asking, asking, asking for slides. Yes, of course, I can give them. I will hand over this to uh, Takshan in the department. Uh, and definitely you can collect them. No problem. And also we'll be uh, in your uploading uh, the whole... Uh, talk as well all right so okay. so with that uh, then we'll uh, uh, conclude uh, the lecture today so thank you very much uh, for your time and your uh, expert uh, uh, talk today so thank i'm you. sure students uh, had a nice experience uh, in uh, managing patients with dengue right so thank you very much okay good thank night you. to everybody thank you good night thanks sir